Welcome to the New America Foundation. My name is Patrick Doherty. I am the Deputy Director of the American Strategy Program here at New America. Um, we're really pleased today to release an important report by Bill Hartung and Frida Berrigan, who run our Arms and Security Initiative here at New America. The title is U.S. Weapons at War. If you have not uh, picked up a copy of the report, uh, it's in back. Uh, for our online audience, I encourage you to go to the Arms and Security homepage at the at newamerica.net um, and uh, download to your heart's content. Um, for all those uh, arms control groupies here, Bill has uh, agreed to uh, sign your stapled photocopies in the back. And you can <laughs> do an auto autograph. Um, um, but let's begin. Um, Bill and Frida have managed to give us an important snapshot into the U.S. role in the global arms trade at an especially crucial time. Um, in a moment, Bill will give us the overview of the report's findings and recommendations, but I just want to underline um, why this report is so important. Our reliance on arms transfers as a tool of national policy, to me, is a symptom that our national security architecture is looking at shorter and shorter strategic horizons and looking to the quick, quick fix of arms transfers and ignoring, uh, or at best, discounting the long-term implications of those weapons. Um, in my past life, I lived through this problem in microcosm uh, in the Balkans throughout the 1990s the wars of the 1990s, the United States, Russia, <clears throat> Iran, Europe, and a number of former Soviet republics uh, were shipping arms into the former Yugoslavia for a variety of reasons, some based on policy, some based on profit. In the spring of 2001, however, a mini civil war broke out in Macedonia when the government tried to cut off, and some say take over, uh, the subsequent and very lucrative trade in weapons that certain Albanian criminal organizations had built up and dominated. The Albanian gangs, media savvy from their stint as ethnic rebels in neighboring Kosovo, had told the press their insurgency was a response to the unjust policies of the Slavic majority. For months, those of us working in Skopje were under a light artillery barrage from the village that hosted the region's largest arms bazaar, while the village was in turn pounded by Ukrainian-made hind gunships. The struggle was fought to a tie, and today the Albanian trade continues. The word for this delayed cause and effect uh, of arms shipments um, previously and then this type of um, conflict is blowback. My concern, having read this excellent report, is that we have already set the conditions uh, for blowback, more significant blowback, another round of blowback in the Middle East and South Asia of a magnitude far greater than what I witnessed in the, in the Balkans, what we may be, what we're seeing today already in the Middle East. It's going to happen in, in, in one region that sets the global price for energy and the other that is nuclear tipped. I hope I am wrong. Um, and on that hope, happy note, I will introduce our panel. Um, Bill Hartung is the director uh, of the Arms and Security Initiative and the co author with our own Frida Berrigan of today's report, U.S. Weapons at War. Um, Joy Olson is the executive director of the Washington Office on Latin America. And she will be speaking about the creation of new security assistance programs during the Bush administration. Mark Hisney is a senior researcher at Human Rights Watch. He's kindly uh, offered to join us um, at a moment's notice. Um, and at Human Rights Watch, he works uh, on landmine and cluster munitions um, since 2000. Um, and he'll be batting cleanup for us today. So we'll have Bill introduce the report, and then Joy and Mark make their comments. And then I'll come back up to the podium, and we'll do some Q&A. OK? Bill, thanks. Uh, thank you all for coming. Um, it, it is an uh, incredibly uh, happy report. It's a happy issue. <laughs> I appreciate you coming out on a rainy day to talk about it. Um, I, I will say that if you get a copy, um, you should hold it close because it has all kinds of side benefits. Uh, one of my colleagues, who shall remain nameless, was reading it in a bar, and um, somebody uh, asked them out on a date. So uh, even if we can't solve the the big issue problems, it still may have some side benefits at uh, a more personal level. Um, uh, that being said, um, I've been studying uh, arms trade issues since the late Carter administration. Um, and so you can imagine I've had some disappointments along the way. Um, but um, it, I, I think we're at another moment that happens periodically where we can revisit what our policy should be. Uh, Carter ran. Uh, on a platform of 
reducing weapons sales, of making human rights a uh, central condition for arms transfers, that sort of fell apart for various reasons that we could discuss uh, if, if you'd like. Uh, Ronald Reagan came in as an enthusiastic arms dealer. He was always bragging about these covert arms deals he was making, which kind of sort of ran contrary to the whole idea of them being covert. I mean, you know, <laughs> we didn't put out a list of what we were giving them, but everybody knew who the clients were. Um, uh, Bill Clinton, while talking about keeping weapons out of the hands of dangerous people, also saw that there was commercial progress to be made by promoting uh, arms exports and helping our defense industrial base. Um, George W. Bush, pretty much as with much of his foreign policy, just subsumes it under the global war on terror. And the notion was if you can make an argument that you might help us in some way fight terrorism, we will arm you. We may well subsidize those uh, exports. Um, so uh, this, this is a follow-up on a report we had done a few years ago. Uh, and one of the things that has changed is just the volume of sales has increased dramatically in the last few years. Um, uh, $32 billion in foreign military sales by the United States in 2008, uh, estimate that the, the Pentagon um, put out and, and was published in the New York Times a while back. Um, and there's a big deals in the works uh, that may make 2009 as, as big or bigger. We'll have, we'll have to see how they play out. But there's a, a deal in the works for joint strike fighters to Israel that could be worth up to $15 billion. Uh, there's a THAAD uh, anti-missile defense system, which has never been exported before, uh, in the works to the UAE for about $9 billion. There's various combat helicopters and missile defense related technologies to Taiwan that could be worth up to $7 billion. So in the last few months alone, there have been deals put on the table uh, that would represent more than uh, this recent $32 billion, which in itself was a, was a quite uh, robust year, about three times what was sold um, just three years ago in, in 2005. Um, so I guess, you know, if you're in it for the money, the, the dollar figures matter. But in terms of policy, I suppose the real question is uh, where are the weapons going and what, what purpose might they serve? Uh, and so in that respect, we took we looked at the top 25 U.S. arms um, recipients in the developing world, and then we looked at uh, were they a democracy, how did they rank in um, various human rights assessments, uh, both the State Department and, and um, well-regarded NGOs like Human Rights Watch. And what we found was even by a sort of conservative measure, you know, giving countries the benefit of the doubt, uh, more than half, uh, 13 out of the 25 U.S. Uh, recipients in the developing world, the top 25, were undemocratic regimes or major, major human rights abusers. And those included uh, a lot of the, the Gulf monarchies, of course, places like Saudi Arabia and the UAE, included Egypt, included Colombia, uh, included uh, Pakistan. And I would say the, the bulk of them were kind of qualified on two grounds. They were undemocratic and they had major human rights problems. Um, there's a table an appendix table that is uh, not part of the, the printed document but is, is on the web that sort of goes through uh, how we assess these countries, what, what the um, human rights assessments have to say about them. Um, the, the second thing we looked at was uh, nations at war. And there's sort of a presumption in U.S. policy that we're, uh, when we sell weapons it's for defensive purposes. And I think that's certainly the intent. Uh, but in many cases, the events outrun whatever the intent may have been. And um, in the most recent year uh, for which there are figures, 2006-2007 uh, period, uh, of 27 major conflicts, uh, U.S. weapons and training were present in 20 of them, uh, generally on the government side of the coin when it was an internal conflict. Uh, in some cases, there's uh, rivals that were busy arming uh, as we speak. Uh, and some of the, the major nations in that regard included uh, in Africa, Kenya, Ethiopia, Nigeria, of course, uh, Iraq and Afghanistan were right in the middle of those conflicts. It would be surprising if we weren't uh, supplying weapons. Uh, places like the Philippines, where there's U.S. advisors as well as significant weaponry, uh, Thailand. Uh, you have the case of Georgia, where the Obama administration is going to have to decide how to deal uh, with Russia's aggressive policy there, and they've been a significant recipient of arms and training during the Bush years. Um, you have Israel and Lebanon, 
uh, Israel used U.S. cluster munitions in the 2006 war in Lebanon. At the same time, we're now trying to arm and kind of refurbish uh, the Lebanese army. Um, and then there's some conflicts that where U.S. Uh, transfers are quite minimal, but I think still have symbolic importance, the fact that the U.S. is transferring anything, uh, Democratic Republic of the Congo, Chad, uh, Uganda, Nepal. Uh, none of these transfers would in and of themselves have a major impact on the conflict, but I, I think the fact that there's even the notion that we might supply any kind of military training or equipment, I, I think, is um, raises questions on a symbolic level of just sort of where we where we stand in the world. Um, in addition to who gets the weapons, there's a question of who's paying for it. And one of the interesting things, which Joy will get into a, a bit more, is um, there's been this whole uh, range of new security assistance programs that have developed since the Bush administration came into office. And they kind of build off of the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, the train and equip programs there. But there's also a global train and equip program that is run by the Pentagon uh, authorized, implemented by the Pentagon, separate from the traditional uh, foreign military financing and uh, international military education and training programs uh, that are authorized by, at, at the State Department. Uh, there's coalition support fund uh, for uh, countries that are engaged with the U.S. in Iraq and Afghanistan. There's a special separate aid program for that. Uh, there's the Commander's Emergency Response Program, which is for commanders in the field in Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, but now there's a, a global version of that that's being rolled out um, called the Commanders, uh, Combatant Commanders Initiative Fund. So it, you sort of started with the Pentagon having uh, new security assistance tools in the context of these two wars, and now they're sort of trying to globalize that and it has all kinds of implications, I think, for transparency, for accountability, for the relative weight of concerns about uh, human rights versus other considerations that go into deciding who to sell. Uh, weapons to. Um, and so I, I guess the, um, you know, the, the question that arises, and, and there's no one answer, uh, obviously each of these deals has its own logic. Uh, and it's, sometimes it has to do with getting access to military facilities, sometimes it has to do with helping a coalition country that's fighting alongside U.S. troops in Iraq. Uh, sometimes it's more of a, um, you know, it's pointed at a, at a possible threat of the future, like some of these missile defense uh, system exports. Uh, but I, I think what's been missing is um, kind of a sense of balance. Uh, more and more, the human rights concerns have sort of gotten pushed aside by these other considerations. Is it access to military facilities? Is it uh, forming a relationship with a country that's got access to oil and gas supplies? Uh, is it a coalition partner in some particular conflict? Uh, without thinking about the fact that the uh, arming human rights abusers is not just a moral issue, it's also a security issue. Uh, if you uh, arm a country that then, as was mentioned, uh, either turns against you or the weapons fall into um, uh, hostile hands, uh, you've created problems that you'll have to deal with for decades down the road, long after the relationship that was the deal was premised on with a particular government or movement uh, has long since passed into history. Um, and so what I would like to see, given that we are going to have a new administration and they have hardly anything else to do, um, is for them to take a look at uh, our arms transfer policy writ large and say, well, what are the relative weights that should be given to nonproliferation concerns, to ability to wage coalition warfare, to human rights? Uh, what kind of accountability and transparency should we have so that people know who we're arming, for what reasons, in what amounts of money, and what kinds of equipment are being uh, transferred? Um, should we rejoin some of the international efforts that we've stood aside from uh, during the Bush administration uh, on landmines, on cluster munitions, which we'll hear about, uh, on a sort of more uh, longer range look at maybe having a global arms transfer treaty, which um, uh, conventional arms uh, trade really is on a global scale relatively unregulated compared to uh, nuclear chemical and biological weapons, even though these are the weapons more likely to be used in any given day, uh, in any given conflict. So um, that's just an overview of some of the issues that we get into in the report, uh, but I want to pass on to my colleagues to dig into details on a couple of the 
specific points, and then hopefully we can have a good discussion. Thank you. Thanks, Joy. Sometimes I go on too long. Um, hi, I'm Joy Olson uh, at the Washington Office on Latin America. Some of you are probably wondering why they asked a Latin Americanist to stand up here and talk. Um, and just to prove that we've been looking at these issues for a really long time, I thought I, I would bring a, a few of our publications from back years. And, and what we've been looking at is the migration of authorities from on, on security issues from the State Department to the Defense Department. Uh, the first one, when we were just kind of catching wind of this and trying to, to make a point about it, we called blurring the lines, that the lines between state and defense on security issues were being blurred. But we didn't get enough attention that year, so we decided to change the title the next year and made it Erasing the Lines. Um, and then uh, this year, as we, uh, we decided to address some um, of uh, the expanding issues that Bill talked about, uh, we just named it Ready, Aim, Foreign Policy. Um, uh, why Latin America has seen these migration on security issues from state to defense is, is mostly because of the prevalence of, of uh, U.S. counter drug programs with Latin America. Um, in about 1990, the U.S. Congress gave uh, the U.S. military the, the job of detecting and monitoring drugs coming into the United States. Um, a, a position which many in the military actually didn't like at the time. But once they were given the authority, they, um, they implemented it. And uh, what you see happening after that is a growing number of um, legislative authorities that, that accompanied that mission. And uh, what we saw were a few of them. I'm just going to throw out some technical names, but we can talk about them if you like. One was called uh, Section 1004, which is really where the counter drug authorities were. And then there were smaller ones that came up, uh, 1033, which was a maritime authority. There was another authority for the transfer of parts to Mexico for a bunch of helicopters that were given at one time. Um, and then you see the really big global ones taking place. Um, uh, before I get to there, as, as we looked at the counter drug authorities, and in particular uh, U.S. military training of Latin Americans, um, what, what we found was that uh, uh, instead of military training going through the normal State Department channels, that it, um, uh, uh, it, it had shifted over and was taking place to a great extent through funding authorities that were directly in, uh, in the Department of Defense. And from 1999 through, I think, 2005 was the last thing I was just looking at, um, it, it was somewhere between 60 and 75 percent of the U.S. military training that was done with Latin America was paid for with DOD money. Um, so you can see we have been watching this for quite a while. Then came along um, uh, with the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq, the, the big authorities that um, Bill mentioned, one that's called uh, Section 1206, which is the authority that allows you to train and equip foreign forces directly through DOD's budget. Prior to that, DOD could train and equip for counter drug purposes, but this may, is, is uh, the, the new thing of, of 1206 was a much broader uh, authority that um, you didn't have to justify it under a counter drug mission. It was for um, counter terrorism and stability operations. Um, uh, and you know, one would think you wouldn't have spent much of that money in Latin America or any of it, uh, considering the definition of the mission, but there were programs that, that de developed in Latin America uh, under those authorities as well. And then uh, 1207, which was the Reconstruction and Stabilization Fund. Uh, and the thing that I find interesting about that one is it, it ju we just got to the point where everybody kind of admitted that it was easier to um, fund stuff through the Pentagon and through the State Department. So in the, in the 12, uh, 1207 authority, they just went right to it. They funded the State Department directly through the DOD budget. Um, what we see happening at the at the same time as these uh, uh, changes in authorities with the Defense Department taking on more of a, uh, a central role and really the authorities of state going over to defense is, is something else, which is the, tra the transformation of the command structure. Excuse me. Grab my water. Um, what I mean by that is that uh, there was a decision made that the command structures within the militaries were um, uh, were going to be changed. 
And there were two places, uh, there have been two places where they've decided to, that, that have been the, the, the guinea pigs, or um, uh, as Southcom refers to it, the, they're the petri dish um, when it comes to the command transformation. And the transformation is this. Um, they went from having a strictly military definition to having a definition of being a joint interagency security command. And, and so what does that mean in terms of your mission statement and what you're supposed to do? Well, for the Southern Command, it meant it went from being, um, uh, their mission was to conduct military operations and promote security cooperation to achieve U.S. strategic objectives. So it went from that to its new mission, which is um, uh, to be a joint, a leading <coughs> joint and interagency organization seeking to support security, stability, and partnership in the Americas. And an earlier draft said prosperity, but they, they got a lot of feedback on that. Um, uh, so you have this really, really broad mission uh, out there, and uh, the question is, is what do you do with it? Well, the, um, the planning document that accompanies this transformation uh, it talks about it talks about the problems facing Latin America, and I really think it gets it right in that sense because the problems that they address are, or that they define are that poverty and inequality are the main challenges facing the region, and and after that public security is very high on the list, and if you talk about security issues with Mexico or Central America, um, what you really end up talking about is public security, gangs, drugs, organized crime. The question then becomes, what's the military mission in relation to gangs, drugs, and organized crime, which are normally not seen as, as uh, um, lending themselves to military solutions? Um, and the, uh, what, what has developed uh, and is now being implemented at the Southern Command is that, uh, um, that they want to use their resources to, um, uh, to coordinate and um, uh, address basically the current challenges facing the region. They don't see themselves as, as leading the U.S. government uh, in the response, but they see themselves as being uh, really good coordinators and problem solvers. And they see themselves as the body that has the, the good regional overview of the region. But they make it very clear that they're not trying to usurp. Um, but we think that who's in charge actually does matter. And I think the counter-drug example that Latin America has seen for the past 20 years or more is, is, a, good, uh, is a good point to look back at because um, as the U.S. military was given uh, a role in uh, uh, responding to drug issues, they looked for partners in the region to help them fulfill their mission. And who they went to were the regional militaries. And so you see, if you look back in documents around training in particular um, over the past uh, 20 years, or 10 years in particular on training, what you'll see is that they very uh, deliberately say that they are encouraging Latin American militaries to take on counter-drug roles. So, um, so I think what our military does and how it's defined in relationship to the region and the relationship into uh, uh, kind of non-military issues is very important. And also, um, I think the perspective that the coordinating institution brings to problem solving is important too. Um, uh, one of them, one of the issues has been youth gang violence in Central America. And uh, if you talk to the realm of people who do deal with gang issues, uh, there's a sector that see it as a uh, youth violence as a public health issue. Uh, and there are others who see it as a, um, uh, something that, that deserves more of a, a close to military response. So who is coordinating actually we think is quite important. Um, uh, but it's been, it's been interesting because if you raise these issues of coordination and, and what should the military be, be doing in response to things that are non-traditional uh, non uh, threats, um, they, they really see you as being old school, that you're stuck in the past, that you're not responding to new threats, what, what are defined as new threats, which is interesting because the new threats are gangs, drugs, and organized crime, which, you know, uh, it may have been new in 1900, but uh, um, you know have not been new threats in this region recently. Um, uh, and uh, and in the context of Latin America, uh, what we see is that you know calling the military to respond to uh, non-military issues because the civilians are either considered too incompetent or too corrupt to address them. Um, I think is really an old school approach because we've definitely seen that in the past. 
Um, and I think what it gets down to on uh, both in relation to Latin America and here is that we need a functioning State Department when it comes to security issues. And within Latin America, there need to be functioning public security institutions. And that that's really the issue, that those are the issues that we should be looking at. And as the next administration, as the Obama administration comes in, um, uh, these, um, these issues should be, uh, should be brought up. These authorities that we, we started out talking about, in particular uh, 1206 and 1207, the Training and Equipping Authority and um, the Reconstruction Authorities, those are temporary authorities. So they will, um, they will expire and need to be reviewed uh, within either, either next year or over the next few years. And uh, uh, we hope these are issues that um, uh, the administration takes another look at and uh, reinforces the role of state. Thank you, Joyce. Mark. Um, thank you. Um, cluster bombs in 10 minutes. Um, as many of you know, last week, uh, 94 states gathered in Oslo to sign a new treaty that comprehensively prohibits a whole class of weapons. And they're known as cluster munitions or cluster bombs. Um, cluster munitions are large weapons that contain dozens or hundreds of smaller submunitions. Um, they cause unacceptable humanitarian harm in two ways. First, their broad area effects kill and injure civilians during strikes. They are area weapons. In military parlance, they're known as grid square removers because they can spread out blast and fragmentation over quite a large area. Secondly, many submunitions do not explode. Um, it's bad design, essentially. And they become de facto landmines that cause civilian casualties for months or years after the conflict is over. Um, to put that in human terms, um, Human Rights Watch has been investigating the use of cluster munitions formally since 1999 in their use in Kosovo and Serbia, or what was then Yugoslavia. Um, we also conducted missions in Iraq, Afghanistan, uh, Lebanon, Israel, and Georgia. And we kept seeing the same repeating pattern. Uh, people died during the strike because they were proximate to it and the cluster bomb came into their house or wherever they were and people died or were maimed after the event because they interacted with the dud submunitions. Um, again, I'm going to use just use one example here to sort of illustrate the, the issue. Um, there's a weapon system called the Multiple Launch Rocket System. It's a U.S. designed and manufactured weapon and also the Europeans have been co-producing it. They were used extensively in Iraq in 1991, 2003, and by Israel and southern Lebanon in 2006. The rocket contained 644 submunitions, like this one right here. This is 644 of them in one rocket. Generally, you fire six rockets at a target. Um, that gets you to about 3,800 of these things being dispersed over a generous square kilometer all impacting at once. The Iraqis in 1991 started calling them steel rain. Um, the dud rate for this um, is anywhere between 5 and 15 percent, and that's being generous based on U.S. controlled testing. So that you would have, generally, on average, somewhere between two to 600 of these submunitions laying on the ground, hanging in the trees, in someone's basement, under a dining room table, um, spread out over that square kilometer. They're very attractive. What's the first thing you want to do? Pick it up and spin it around. That was generally probably the last thing you do because that would set off the arming device. Uh, in Lebanon, we found these hanging on the people's uh, rear view mirrors in their cars. Not very healthy. Um, they could land in an armed or unarmed condition, and unless you know what you're looking at, there's no way to tell if they're, and if they're armed or not. In fact, when I spun it around, this little pin slid out, and that would arm it. So doing that would explode it. That thing exploding in this room would kill or injure just about everyone in the room. It would be lethal within four meters and would, if all the fragments weren't taken up by the people in the front row, would hit everyone. Now, this is the continuing problem we saw again and again. And in 1999, in Geneva, we called for states to stop using these things until the problems were addressed and solved. We've, that solution was reached last week in Oslo, and 94 countries are there. Um, yes, some of the major producers and users of them are not there. Russia, China, Israel, India, Pakistan, etc. But it sets the standard. It creates the stigma. It creates a new norm of international behavior, 
and it will get rid of these weapons. Um, and these weapons are ubiquitous in the military. The M26 rocket example, um, the U.S. active inventory of them currently is over 360,000 rockets. And I think the, uh, the math on that would get you to about 237 million submunitions in the active inventory. We've exported them to 13 states. And nothing brought this home more than in August of 2006 when Israel began using these uh, quite liberally in South Lebanon in retaliation to rocket fire by Hezbollah. Uh, the basic tactic here was the Israelis would detect a rocket launch and within 90 seconds have six rockets containing those things shooting at that grid square, hoping that they would be able to catch the rocket launcher before it moved um, a kilometer away. It was also the same tactic used um, south of, in the southern suburbs of Baghdad when the U.S. took artillery fire from those suburbs and saturated the suburbs with cluster munitions. Um, the same pattern again and again. That incident really provided the political impetus for nations, um, particularly many of the U.S., European, and NATO allies, to say enough is enough. These weapons were designed for a, a war that never happened, the Cold War. Masses of Soviet tanks conveniently crossing open fields in Germany, where you'd be able to use these and reduce the numbers. The basic idea behind the cluster munition is to be able to kill faster. Um, the German scientists we got after World War II uh, looked at the problem of mass North Korean and Chinese human wave attacks in the Korean War and came up with this idea of reducing the amount of explosive in a in a container or a projectile and spreading it out over a larger area and having more fragments to be able to kill North Koreans faster. It morphed into being able to kill Soviet tanks faster. Um, that scenario never happened. These things have never been used in a way that they were originally designed for. Um, but because there were so many of them, uh, the U.S. stockpile at the height of the Cold War had in excess of a billion submunitions. I think that's uh, about 5.8 million containers containing a billion submunitions. 80% um, of the U.S. Army's fire support, um, rocket artillery and projectile artillery, are cluster munitions. The bulk of the Marine Corps' fire support, and still is, cluster munitions. Um, needless to say, the U.S. was not a participant in the process that began in Oslo in February of 2007 and resulted in the treaty that was signed last week. Um, in fact, the U.S. was quite hostile to the process and used considerable diplomatic, military, and political um, leverage to have, our, to have countries not to sign it, um, particularly the countries where the U.S. has used them. Um, the U.S. put a lot of diplomatic pressure on Iraq and Afghanistan not to sign the convention. Um, we are hopeful Iraq will still sign, and in probably the most dramatic moment in Oslo was uh, when Afghanistan announced that it was going to sign and, in fact, did. Um, but all is not um, negative on the U.S. and cluster munitions. In Geneva in, Feb or in November of 2006, the U.S. said in front of the Convention of, on Conventional Weapons, um, there was no need to negotiate anything on cluster munitions. There's no need for a treaty. Um, today, we have a new S a new uh, policy on cluster munitions from DOD that essentially in 10 years, by 2018, will put the U.S. out of the cluster munitions business. Any cluster munition that produces more than 1 percent unexploded ordnance will not be able to be used then. In fact, that's de facto compliance with the treaty. Um, since December of 2006, uh, through the Omnibus Appropriations Act, the U.S. is out of the export business of these cluster munitions at least through the fiscal year, and I think that's been, and it has been extended through the uh, continuing resolution into March of 2009. But still, um, we have exported cluster munitions to 28 states. Um, many of those did sign the convention, 18 of uh, the 26 NATO partners did, um, but there's still too many cluster munitions out there, and the U.S. is still on the outside of this process looking in and being hostile. What can we do? Um, do we expect the new administration in its first 100 days to come out and sign, you know, say it was going to sign or reverse the policy? I'm rather sanguine about that. I think there's probably other priorities 
and the track record isn't good for democratic administrations uh, going after the military in their first days to, after weapons. You saw this with the Clinton administration and the landmine ban. I believe the word was he couldn't cross the joint staff at the time. Um, however, um, we will continue to um, push the legislative moratorium. There is uh, another piece of legislation that is still out there that would restrict the use in populated areas. Um, and the U.S. is going to be continually under pressure um, not to use these weapons. They haven't been used since Iraq and Afghanistan because they don't really um, work well in counterinsurgency or asymmetrical conflicts. Uh, there are policies in Afghanistan and Iraq right now um, that prohibit the use of these munitions in operations. So that is another good sign. So we have a lot of work to do in terms of getting the U.S. to, one, uh, de facto comply, um, not to use the weapons to clean up after themselves, and uh, interestingly, to start cleaning up after the exports. Um, I was in Thailand in October asking them why they weren't signing, and they basically told me um, they can't afford to destroy the cluster munitions that the U.S. gave us in the late 70s. They've been sitting in um, ammunition storage bunkers at Uthod Air Base where the U.S. Air Force left them and the Thais haven't touched them in 25 years, but they don't know or can't afford to get rid of them. So there is room for maneuver of that. Um, and we will t continue to take these incremental steps that will push countries like the U.S. because we still have the ability to um, have action taken that will force that will result in de facto compliance, paralleling what we've done with anti-personnel mines. The U.S. hasn't used those since 1991, even though they were thought to be a critical weapon and haven't been used, exported, or produced since um, 1997 when the treaty was signed that banned those weapons. And the last thought I'd like to leave you with is um, a particularly interesting advocacy angle we have with the U.S. Um, where we kind of bring together the humanitarian and military equities. Um, I was a soldier in the Desert Storm era, and many of my um, friends just out of our school um, encountered U.S. submunitions on the battlefield. They were fired at the Iraqis, and the U.S. moved so fast through them that the U.S. was taking casualties driving through its own dud fields. In fact, 80 U.S. service people were killed by, their own cl by U.S. cluster munitions as a result of uh, Operation Desert Storm. Um, those same leaders who were leading maybe a platoon of 40 men at that time in Iraq in 2003 um, were leading units of 800 to 2,300 men and women, and they ran into the same problem in Iraq. They fired cluster munitions and had to drive through them. Uh, for people in tanks, that's really not a big deal. It's a bump in the road. But when you're in uh, non-armored vehicles, um, you have curious soldiers. They don't know what they are. They haven't received training. The, again, the first instinct is look what I got, and to pick them up. So those same leaders, um, after Iraq and when we started interviewing the U.S. troops uh, immediately after the conflict, were calling these weapons losers. They were calling them Cold War relics. Uh, we had to use them because we had no other type of ammunition. Uh, our longest range artillery system at that time, the MLRS rocket, was the only thing that could shoot back at the Iraqi artillery the only warhead available for it at the time contained cluster munitions. So the military is living with a, a legacy of procurement decisions made 20 years ago, and they're kind of stuck with them right now. But by 2018, when their um, shelf life expires, they'll be out of the business. And also that equity, that concept of equity, is also useful to link with the concept of liability. Um, the U.S. Um, is a leader in cleaning up battlefields around the world uh, to the tune of $1.3 billion over the past 15 years. Um, we've provided $37.5 million to Laos since 1993, a country we frankly bombed back into the Stone Age with cluster munitions. I was in Laos in October and uh, witnessed the destruction of 200 and 40 some odd submunitions that were buried in a schoolyard that were just being cleared. Um, that country, it will take decades, if not hundreds of years, to clear up the cluster munitions that were dropped during the Vietnam conflict. And more recently, the United States has provided $15 million to Lebanon since August of 2006 
to clean up the cluster munitions that were used by Israel there. Um, our weapons provided to Israel, um, and we're planning to clean them up too. And more frighteningly, during uh, a lesser known part of uh, aspect of that conflict is Hezbollah fired about 119 cluster munitions into northern Israel, uh, causing casualties there too. So this concept of the proliferation of cluster munitions now to non-state armed groups um, was another motivation causing people to really wonder why we are, why these weapons are still in use and what really is their utility. So that was probably a little more than 10 minutes. Sorry about that. That was good. Thank you, Mark. Yeah, that's great. That's scary. Good presentation. Um, Thank you to all of you for a great presentation. Um, I want to take the first question, and then we'll open up to Q and A. Um, and I want to kind of bring it back from the individual cluster bomb up to the strategic kind of thirty thousand feet, and pick up on something that Joy said. Um, you said, you know, part of this, part of getting the um, um, the role of arms transfers into some type of more strategic or into more healthy balance is is rebalancing the relationship between State Department and Defense Department. And um, it turns out Secretary of Defense Gates is with you on that. I mean, he, I think it was not too many months, I think it was in July that he made a speech um, s um, saying, hey, look, there are more members of the military in military bands than there are foreign service officers, um, which was a, just an incredible um, statement of, of, of scale. And, and my sense is that you've got with General Jones coming in at National Security Council, um, with Hillary Clinton coming in at state, you've got the potential for that. Um, and I want to, I'd like to get your thoughts on what you think the prospects are generally with the administration, but also if we're actually, if, if we're actually successful in, in rebalancing that relationship um, in, in terms of the, who, who really kind of controls the direction of our national security policy, um, or, or right sizing the role of the Defense Department. If they're successful, um, to what extent is Congress really a driver of the arms transfer question? Because because my sense is that it's a it's a it's still a um, a subordinate function of the very effective use of a kind of a 50 state strategy in terms of the Defense Department procurement process, um, and it's that still is going to have a life of its own and a driving force of its own. And we saw, you know, even with a, a Bush administration. Um, uh, in, the, in, the, in the, the, the last two years of the Bush administration with a de Democratic Congress, you still had them expanding the, the, the defense budget um, over the request from the Bush administration. So there, there could be really some, um, some other issues at play, even if the Obama administration is better on this issue. So I just wanted to get your thoughts on that, and then we'll open it up. Um. Why don't you just take it right out yeah, of that? Okay. Um, uh, you know, Gates, um, uh, I, I was incredibly encouraged by Gates' uh, comments early in, or in the year on this and when he testified with Rice um, before Congress. I think, though, you can't, it, this isn't a give me that, uh, that mm -hmm. you've got Gates and the Pentagon and, and Hillary Clinton and the State Department and this is all going to work itself out. And in part because, because I think there's a big contradiction be between you know, what they're saying there and what's going on within the command transformation. Because for me, uh, the question that policymakers should be asking are, what are the institutions we need to address the problems at hand? Mm -hmm. and, um, and I think if you're asking that question, you're not saying, how do we rejigger the command structure so that it can deal with a broader set of issues? Mm -hmm. You say, what are the functioning parts of the U.S. government that should best respond to these issues? Uh, and then, uh, you know, how to get them to work together. So I think instead of figuring out uh, that, that, that we have it a little bit backwards there still. And um, uh, I think it's going to take uh, some, some real effort and deep thought in working this out. And also, I think Congress is a huge uh, part of the problem um, because, uh, because it, you know, they, they do stuff like uh, decide to fend – uh, uh, fund the State Department through the Pentagon, and, and they, they know very well what they're doing. It's just easier for them to do that that way. So I think it's definitely an issue that we have have to talk about a lot. Um, well, I, I was interested, the New York Times had a piece in the last couple weeks about how there was going to be a sweeping change in the balance of foreign policy because we had people like uh, Gates staying on, we had Jim Jones coming in, the, the notion of their various um, statements about um, 
putting more emphasis on uh, diplomacy, on civilian capabilities, and so forth. Um, and I think there's, there's a resource question, which is in the same speech that Gates gave about, um, you know, well, the first one was at Kansas State University. He's reiterated it since then. But he also said, well, you know, just by the way, <clears throat> not from my budget. In fact, I want my budget to increase even <coughs> if and as we get out of Iraq and Afghanistan. He's, he's signed on to the 4% club, which says 4% um, of our GDP should go <coughs> to the military even, as, even if we are disengaged uh, from Iraq and Afghanistan. So uh, something's going to have to give on the resource front. And I ideally, if the administration works the way it's supposed to, that's above his pay grade. He's an implementer, not a decider. But uh, you know, it doesn't always work out that way. Um, in, in terms of, you know, I, I think I have no question if we had more um, robust and um, agile kind of civilian tools of diplomacy, we we wouldn't maybe lean on arms transfers uh, from a policy point of view as much as we do now. Uh, but as Patrick pointed out, there is kind of a kind of a bureaucratic pork barrel element, and a, a lot of what uh, gets sold is. Uh, there are things that wouldn't otherwise be getting bought, like F-16 combat aircraft. Um, there's things like the this <coughs> sale of the uh, FAD anti-missile system, which I, I think is kind of amazing. I mean, you know, we haven't proved that it could work for us, so let's sell the problem to somebody else. Um, and you know, as I mentioned, as there's going to be some pressure on the military budget just by virtue of the economic crunch that we're in, um, these sales are going to look more and more attractive. Uh, because if you can make a $15 billion deal for equipment that's already in the pipeline, that you've already got the tooling, the R&D's already been done, you can add, uh, add some uh, money on in terms of what kind of support services you provide. It's, it's a tremendously good deal for the companies, and it's kind of a, it seems like a free good until you realize in some cases we're paying for it anyway, as in the case of Israel, although the, the, the cost of some of these things are, would chew through their uh, security assistance pretty rapidly if they go through as planned. Uh, and the countries that can't afford to pay, you have to think about the cost down the road if they end up using them in ways that are not in uh, our interest. So it's, but I think there's going to be a, there'll, there'll be a um, kind of a urge to see arms sales as kind of a counterbalance as what I expect to see as a, uh, some reductions in, in uh, weapons procurement. So, so there'll be a huge pork barrel issue and it'll be situated heavily in the congressional um, area. Interesting. Thanks. Okay. Sir, uh, Andrew, you can state your name and then affiliation. Andrew Pierre, Georgetown University, Conville. Good to see you. And there's a microphone coming right behind you. Thank Bill you. Bill and I have been on these, he much more than me, but we've been on these issues for equal amounts of time, roughly. Is it on? Thank you. Um, I thought you asked, Mr. Dorsey, I think you asked a key question, a very important broad scale question. I think we've got a partial answer so far, but not, not, not a full answer. I mean, if you go back to uh, when Carter came in, restraining arms sales was one of the key elements of his foreign <coughs> policy, along with nuclear proliferation and, and human rights, those three. If you go back to Clinton, there, there was the right talk, but the walk didn't go right. But it did lead to some attempts to look at the macro issues, not just the specifics. And it did lead to the Vosnar arrangement. And part of my question, Bill, is where you think the Vosner arrangement stands now and whether it could be revived or made more uh, significant. You may want to say a little bit about what the Vosner arrangement is for those who aren't familiar with it. Um, but if you look at where we are today, um, and if you focus on small arms, cluster bombs, that sort of landmines, we've made some progress, but I think you, I think you and Ms. Olson have pointed out the difficulties, it seems to me, given the congressional role and so on. And what's missing, and I, don't, I haven't heard this from the Obama people in any way or other, is sort of a broader vision uh, which will encompass major armed systems, which would encompass regional balances, as in the Middle East, um, which would sort of give an overarching policy <coughs> drive initiative to doing something about the sweep of arms sales and the competition among the major suppliers. And until we get to that point, if we ever do, it seems to me it's going to be very hard to make any significant progress just by burrowing in on 
small arms and specialized things like cluster and landmines and so on. But I'd be interested in your view. Thank you. Uh, well, anybody who already knows what the Wassenaar arrangement is should go to lunch because you already know way too much. Um, <laughs> but um, so I'll, I'll see you later, Bailey. Uh, <laughs> um, but um, it, without getting into great detail, it, it was a it's a coordinating mechanism to for major suppliers to talk about what they're selling to whom and and to in some extent to jawbone each other about whether some of these <coughs> deals are such a good idea. And so, in the absence of a, an actual treaty, it's the, it's the best we have in terms of some sort of coordination of, among the big suppliers um, to deal with major arms sales. And it, it was kind of a follow-on to the, during the Cold War, there was a, a much stricter uh, arrangement called COCOM that was focused particularly on keeping military technology out of the hands of um, Eastern Bloc countries. And, and this is broader, but it's also much less, uh, much more flexible, much less, uh, more of a voluntary kind of uh, discussion arrangement than, a, than a, um, anything you would consider an agreement. So, so the question is, um, if we're going to have a more multilateral approach to diplomacy, could something like this be put on the table? And I think in the short term, I, I don't see it. I mean, that there's, it's kind of an open book as far as I can tell in terms of what an Obama administration might do. Um, he has been strong on things like um, spending money to clean up caches of small arms and light weapons. He's at least expressed openness to looking at the idea of the uh, cluster munitions ban, uh, reconsidering the current policy, which is basically uh, against it, or at least against it in, in a, except for, unless you look at a 10-year horizon. Um, and uh, you have people like Vice President Biden, who hasn't been heard from since he was nominated, but is still there, I understand. Um, he. Um, was, has been very critical of some particular deals, like the idea of F-16s to Pakistan in the midst of all the turbulence in that part of the world. Um, so I, I wouldn't rule out that over a, you know, a year or two, there, you might not be able to bring some of these things onto the agenda. And uh, the advantage, of course, of a multilateral approach is you don't accomplish that much if you've decided you know, it's not really ideal for this kind of technology to be flowing into this region in this amount at this time. Uh, if uh, France and Russia don't agree with you. I mean, you've got to have some sort of, uh, you know, common perspective, some give and take, if you're going to have an impact on what's actually available to people, as opposed to just controlling your own um, exports. And it, it's a little. I mean, the U.S. has got such a big lead that it, it somewhat masks that. But if, if we were to pull back, there's certainly uh, countries ready and willing to to make some of those sales. So. I, I'm hopeful, but I haven't seen, as you said, I haven't seen any discussion of that, or it's not in what what I understand is their you know uh, large agenda that they've uh, put in front of themselves to for starters. Mm -hmm. So, but I would hope that maybe we could raise that, and, and if they would embrace something like the, the cluster munitions uh, ban, it would be a, a beginning down the road towards a more multilateral approach to the broader arms transfer uh, question. I'm actually going to be interested to see, um, especially with Susan Rice, the signal that, that the Obama campaign sent with putting Susan Rice at, at the UN, kind of looking as the chief multilateral diplomat, to what extent are they going to pick up on some of the recommendations that came out of the, the, the late 90s? The, I'm thinking about the Carnegie Commission on Preventing Deadly Conflict, where they said one of the things you need to do is build capable partners, and hopefully those are going to be regional collective security organizations, um, like the African Union or you know, the, the, we, NATO is, of course, the preeminent one. But building up, in Africa's case, building up the capacity of the African Union to deal with internal conflict. So it would be interesting to see to what extent we see a shift in the Obama administration towards a focus on regional multilateral organizations um, and then the process of building up their interoperable capability. Um, and that's going to be, it would be essentially shifting the locus of the transfers from uh, a bilateral uh, arrangement to some type of U.S. supplying, the kind of building up a, some type of capable partner in various regions, whether it's ASEAN in Southeast Asia or Afri uh, the African Union in Africa. Um, and whether or not that could be a way of, of dealing with this problem and, and dealing with the security challenge um, in a more responsible way. But um, did anybody else want to pick up? On? Okay, another question uh, right here. Uh, just wait for the microphone. It's coming behind you. I'm Penny Starr with CNS News. I'm wondering, um, 
it seems to me that Obama, his advisors and the cabinet and the people he's appointing, and even he said on the campaign trail um, that the so-called war on terror is being won. The surge in Iraq has worked because of more military. He's talked about more military going into Afghanistan. In fact, they're already putting into place plans to redeploy people to Afghanistan instead of Iraq. And um, he backed off a little, but also talked about going in military action in Pakistan. So I'm wondering how that fits with your vision. And also, so what would he do? What, what do you see Obama doing as these lists and tables you have about taking arms away from people who we consider uh, our allies or part of a coalition against the war on terror? Thank you. Uh, well, I, I think um, I, I don't see it so much as taking arms away from countries. First of all, they're not going to give them back. But uh, <laughs> I think it's more sort of what the criteria are going forward, of what, what kind of weapons you want to sell, for what purposes, and what criteria you want to use. And I think the, the point of this report is just kind of a um, to some degree, a snapshot of where we are. You know, how does it come to be that more than half of our clients in the developing world are uh, undemocratic regimes or significant human rights abusers? Uh, why is it that the majority of the conflicts in the world involve parties that have gotten arms or training from the United States? Is this just the way the world works? Can we do better? Uh, you know. Uh, can you, Can you elaborate on the human rights? Because I didn't see where it specifically you talked about what human rights violations. Oh, yeah, well, we, we did, um, and unfortunately, it's not in the, there's a table that goes into some detail, but it's in the web version, not the, we didn't print the full report uh, today because it's longer than it needs to be. Uh, but um, we probably should have printed that part because it is helpful. Um, we looked at sort of two levels of criteria. We, we took the top 25 U.S. Uh, arms recipients in the developing world uh, by the actual amount of, you know, dollar volume of weaponry that they received. And then we looked at two things. One, is it a democracy or not? And uh, many of them were not. Uh, but also, what are its human rights, what's its human rights record in terms of things like torture, uh, extrajudicial killings, uh, impunity of the armed forces and the police when they commute human rights abuses? And if they were either undemocratic or they failed on three or four of those sort of very basic uh, human rights uh, standards, for purposes of this analysis, we can sort of them as substantial human rights abusers. So um, there's, there's some details in the table of, you know, quotes from the Human Rights Report and sort of how we arrived at that. But we tried to be somewhat conservative in the sense that there are countries with significant human rights issues that were not labeled as major human rights abusers for purposes of this uh, particular analysis. But uh, the, the purpose of it was just to get a kind of a reality check versus the you know, the rhetoric of our policy is supposed to be we don't arm countries that engage in systematic patterns of human rights abuses, our arms are to be supplied for defensive purposes. Those good intent, intentions always collide with reality, obviously, but when it seems to be this far out of whack, I, I think it raises a question of whether our, we have to take another look at our priority setting, our decision making. So I, I don't think it would ever be a case of we're not going to arm a country that's got human rights problems if we've got other business to conduct with them, if there's a case to be made for a particular transfer. I think it's more an issue of, I think the scrutiny needs to be a lot stricter, and the human rights element needs to be a stronger part of that mix, not the thing that's immediately the first thing that goes uh, out the window when other concerns uh, come into play. Um, in terms of the, the general take of an Obama administration, I, I think it's kind of an open book. I mean, I, I, n I never viewed Barack Obama as some sort of peacenik riding into the White House. I mean, he. He said, you know, I'm not against wars, I'm just against stupid wars. And it remains to be seen whether uh, sending more troops into Afghanistan will be smart or stupid. But um, I think what, what he is grappling with uh, in terms of uh, fighting two wars at once, in terms of the economic crunch in the world, in terms of all the kind of leftover um, angst and aggravation and um, problems that have been caused by a unilateral policy of the, the current administration, uh, I think there are opportunities there for doing very pragmatic things that don't have to rely on the force of arms, that don't have to rely on arms sales as sort of a major bargaining chip of your foreign policy. So uh, I, I don't think there's any um, 
guarantee that that, that would happen, but I, I think he's capable of seizing such an opportunity. He's got a sort of a pragmatic group of people that he's collected around him, and, and I think it really depends on partly what, what they hear from the public, from allies, uh, whether they, they tackle the arms transfer policy part of this problem in a substantial way or, or just do it in a more ad hoc fashion, which is often what uh, ends up happening. Anybody else want to comment? No? Okay. Some more questions? Um, in the back, in the orange? Good. I got in here late, so you may have already addressed this, but... Um, you can identify yourself, too. Daniel Lippman, Johns Hopkins. Um, you talked about the security of our arms transfers, and um, do you think, like, some of the arms that we're selling or giving to Pakistan uh, is being diverted um, to militants or other nefarious purposes that we didn't tell them to do? And um, besides Pakistan, are there any other countries that you're particularly worried about in terms of um, weapons sales going to not the, not the uh, actual <coughs> militaries? Uh, well, in, in terms of Pakistan, I've been more concerned about some of the big ticket items, like, like the F-16 combat aircraft, just because of the, the symbolism, the fact that they can be used to deliver nuclear weapons, the fact that I don't think strafing, uh, you know, villages and training camps is, is going to be a major, um, majorly useful tool in, in, in fighting uh, terrorist groups. Uh, but I, I think for Pakistan and, and uh, Afghanistan, one of the big issues is transparency. We don't really know exactly what we're supplying. Uh, a lot of the aid to Pakistan has been through the Coalition Support Fund program, which basically reimburses allies in the war on terror uh, until the Center <coughs> for Public Integrity and the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists pushed a bunch of Freedom of Information Act requests. We didn't even know how much was being spent under these programs, much less what kinds of weapons were being uh, transferred. Um, the GAO has talked in Afghanistan about uh, the fact that um, people seem to be disappearing uh, from duty, the, the newly, uh, the armed forces that are being trained there by uh, NATO and U.S. troops. Uh, they, they sort of disappear. Sometimes they disappear with their uniforms. Sometimes they disappear with their guns. Uh, sometimes they get paid and they go away for a few weeks and spend the money who knows where. So I, I think we could use a much, um, much more openness as to what we're selling, how we're selling it, how we're keeping track of it. Uh, we've seen in Iraq, um, there's some estimates that several hundred thousand weapons are not accounted for. It doesn't automatically mean they're in the hands of the insurgents, but some of them probably are. It doesn't automatically mean they're all going to the PKK to fight against Turkey, but some of them clearly have. So I, I would say in, in the war zones, in, uh, in Afghanistan, in Iraq, uh, we have to figure out if there's a, a better way to uh, keep track of the small arms and light weapons and perhaps slow the rate at which we're pumping them in there if we don't know where they're going to end up. Um, and I'm not, um, you know, I'm not an expert on weapon security. There's probably other people who would have better ideas of the, how to go about that. But that's something that sort of jumped out as a concern uh, when we were doing the report. It's just that uh, we don't really know um, how much equipment we're transferring. We don't seem to have good techniques for keeping track of uh, what it is that, that we are uh, pouring into those war zones. Joy, in the context of Colombia, are we seeing any of that same problem? Are we seeing the the arms transfers bleed over into the uh, into some of the right wing uh, paramilitaries? What are we? Are there any of these problems cropping up in Latin America generally? Um, Latin America has a, a complicated arms transfer scene at the current moment. Uh, you have. Um, uh, and, and it's, um, uh, uh, it, it's not a real kind of traditional conflict um, uh, situation. Uh, and, and I'm not just talking about Colombia. You've got uh, Venezuela uh, building up weapon stocks dramatically. Um, you've got uh, Brazil really looking to sell more and more within the region and be more of a dominant player in terms of weapon sales. You have, um, you have uh, Mexico, in the cent Mexico in particular, complaining uh, uh, dramatically of uh, illegal weapons uh, being purchased in the United States and brought into Mexico, um, uh, where the gun laws are much stricter. 
uh, and then that feeding the drug, um, the drug cartels uh, being used in, in crime. Uh, and then, uh, you know, the situation in, in Colombia as well, uh, you, you've got a variety of uh, uh, sectors involved in the conflict and just a lot of weapons because it's been going on for a really long time. Uh, so, um, so yeah, you see, you see similar issues, but uh, the context, uh, context is somewhat more varied. Okay, thanks, thanks. Um, the gentleman in front, if you wanted to ask your question. Sure. Yeah, microphone's coming. Hi, I'm Chuck Kozak. I'm the uh, principal director for uh, partnership strategy at the Pentagon. And uh, this is a great discussion. I think uh, it's healthy. Um, a lot of the data that's been uh, discussed, I think, is, is, um, is important. And I think the metrics that you're establishing in terms of uh, how we provide and when we provide uh, weaponry to countries that we perceive to be undemocratic uh, or countries that are already engaged in conflicts is I think these are important metrics that require us to be vigilant. One thing we haven't talked a whole lot about, I think, is the post 9-11 strategic dilemma, if you will. Um, I, you know, I do see and I think many leaders in, on both sides of the aisle, if you, if you will, perceive that that was kind of a strategic inflection point in our history uh, and that our focus uh, needed to change a little bit uh, in terms of how we view threats to this country. Um, and you've seen the national security strategy, the national defense strategy, a lot of uh, official adjustments in terms of how we prepare as a nation, as a whole of government, uh, uh, prepare as a nation to, uh, to prevent rather than react to threats uh, before it's potentially too late. Uh, and so it's a tricky business, and I think that change management is hard no matter what. Uh, it's controversial uh, and, and that sort of thing. But I, I guess from the command perspective, and I just want to hear you comment on it, you know, I don't think that the Africa Command or the, the Southern Command uh, transformation or, or rollout uh, necessarily went perfectly. I think that sometimes when you have the Department of Defense or, you know, officers in uniform start to talk in a language that has traditionally uh, only been used, you know, at the State Department or among NGOs, it makes stakeholders very nervous. Um, but I think the intent um, uh, has always been to try to align these commands in such a way that we're focusing on prevention rather than reaction. I, I don't think that there's been a uh, intent to usurp uh, the authorities of the various departments or to lead in areas where uh, the department lacks comparative advantages, i.e. expertise, and, and certainly lacks resources. <coughs> Uh, to bring to bear. For example, um, it's often noted uh, among uh, various uh, uh, folks in, in town here that that DOD uh, DOD's share of the official defense uh, official development uh, um, uh, was the ODA the official development assistance uh, assistance yeah. uh, has gone from 1998 uh, at about three percent to about 22 percent today. Uh, but, I, but I think in, in part, and you've addressed this, uh, uh, I think, very, very well, um, given the non-permissivity in Afghanistan and Iraq and the lack of ability for the State Department and other uh, entities uh, to, to be in those uh, locations providing their expertise and assistance and bringing resources to bear, uh, DOD has been put in the position where it's had to do things in order to uh, move the war in the right direction. In other words, clear areas of extremists and hold areas and ensure that essential supplies and that sort of thing, fundamental, uh, uh, um, you know, life, uh, you know, maintaining, uh, you know, uh, efforts are made. Um, and so when you look at, when you take Iraq and Afghanistan out of the ODA, uh, in, in fact, the uh, DOD share of ODA has remained stable. It's about 3%. Um, and I know there's a lot about whether or not we should have gone into Iraq in the first place and that kind of thing. But I think it's relevant to say that, uh, you know, that, that DOD is not moving aggressively into all of these areas 
you know, globally to, to take over in areas where certainly there's no congressional authority, there's, there's no comparative <coughs> advantage in terms of expertise. <coughs> but so I think there is, I think a, it, it's, 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 a, it's an ever, it, it's, it's discovery learning, if you will, in terms of working with, with NGOs, working with the State Department, working with AID and other interagency partners to ensure that we're transforming these commands in a way that's, that adds value, that provides better support to OFTA, for example, in a, in a disaster scenario or better support to USAID when they're requiring uh, logistical assistance or any kind of assistance where DOD has a skill set that, that's important and relevant. Uh, and the other thing I would say about the authorities, and, and you brought up an example, Lebanon, which I think is a good example. Uh, you know, and then if we could get to a question. And, and I'll get to the question. Thanks. Uh, if you could comment on these authorities, if you, if you could you know, not just say that this is inherently a bad thing, that 1206, 1207, that this represents, uh, you know, a gravitation of monies to DOD. Uh, talk a little bit more about how these authorities are actually executed. In other words, what are the checks and balances that are in place with respect to state and DOD? And also, what are the congressional notification processes that, that also account for how this money is used? and and how these monies are prioritized. And are they effective the, to are the they extent effective? they exist? Like for example, to the in Lebanon, I'll just one more half second. Um, you have obviously a situation where the government of Iran is, is involved in, in uh, providing support to Hezbollah. You have a situation where uh, decision makers are intent on trying to preserve the efficacy or even the unitary nature, or the efficacy of the Lebanese armed forces or the internal security forces to mitigate Syrian influences, to mitigate uh, Hezbollah's activities. And so if armaments are coming from uh, other uh, entities and organizations at, at a rather precipitous rate, the U.S. is kind of put in a position where it can either provide assistance uh, with checks and balances and that sort of thing to sort of countervail that threat uh, and to try to maintain the efficacy, you know, the, the viability of a government or or that sort of thing. So if you could comment a little bit on those instances where a country is involved in a conflict, uh, where U.S. interests, you know, uh, potentially in the case of Lebanon are paramount to, to justify uh, the provision of armaments to, to uh, countervail a threat. Great. Thanks for your comment and thanks for showing up today. That's, that's great. Um, love to comment. Uh, you know, when um, I, I think there are some things that are really broken about the way we relate to Latin America, which is what I'm going to address, and uh, that um, uh, that there is a real problem with uh, with bad uh, communication and coordination between different parts of the U.S. government as it tries to figure out how to relate to the region. Um, some different, you know, countervailing realities. Uh, uh, Southcom has uh, more people than, I haven't seen new numbers on this in the past five or six years, but uh, Dana Priest did a book um, um, on the commands uh, a while back, and uh, she talked about how Southcom had more people working in it than basically all of the other civilian agencies that were um, uh, of the U.S. government in relation to Latin America. So there's, um, <coughs> there's this huge kind of uh, disproportionality um, uh, at play. But there are real serious problems with coordination. The youth gang violence, great example. Um, uh, you know, justice has a role. Different parts of the State Department should be having a role in, in, in helping Central America with a problem which is very, uh, which is a real uh, intermestic or both U.S. and, and uh, uh, foreign problem. The problem is very real. My question becomes, <coughs> uh, what are the appropriate parts of the U.S. government who, who need to function to be able to, to address these problems? And instead of answering that question, the question that we're answering is, how do we take this enormous amount of people that we have working with the Southern Command, with the, which is a region which basically uh, d doesn't have very big threats looming right now, and, and make them relevant in some way. I, I think that's, that's the question. You know, and then, then you have Southcom identifying very correctly that the main problem in Latin America is poverty. 
And if, if the, in the transformed command structure, the idea is how to, to deal with the threats at hand in a preventative way, then, then what is the Southern Command's role uh, in, in response to poverty as the, pr as, as the primary problem if what you're trying to do is prevent future conflict? I think there are just really fundamental questions at stake here. And, and they've yet to play themselves out because this transformation is quite new. Another, another thing that, I, that I've just heard over this past year um, is that, uh, that um, our, our discussions about development. I mean, um, uh, I, I like Admiral Stravitas. I think he's a great guy and he's brilliant, clearly. Um, uh, and, and one thing he talks about a lot is the comfort ship, which is a military ship that uh, has gone and done um, a humanitarian assistance mission, uh, missions around Latin America. Uh, and I'm sure greatly appreciated. But um, what, what, uh, what Southcom sees as it goes and does these things is that um, if they're just bringing doctors to a community, they're not really addressing the issues that are at hand in the community. And, and I've had conversations with people after they've come back, which were, you know, we need to, um, we need to have relationships with universities in the U.S. who can kind of teach us about um, basically development. And, and I'm sitting there thinking, why am I having this conversation with this group of people? The, the State Department has, you know, decades worth of, of, of research and relationships with academic institutions and experience with um, economic development. And somehow uh, this, um, uh, uh, I, I think it's completely appropriate that the military have a role and an important role in disaster assistance. But somehow we've we've gotten from there to, um, it, it's kind of been bleeding over into development. And, and I, I see that they, those are two incredibly different roles. Um, uh, but I guess my main point is, I think what's missing from this discussion is what's broken. And, and uh, do we need to fix it or should we just have Southcom transform itself in some way that it can, it can do all of the things that the other parts of the U.S. government, which are not functioning correctly, um, are, are not able to uh, uh, facilitate? Well, yeah, th thanks a lot for coming. We, we should do a whole panel on this. Um, <laughs> That's why I'm so long. <laughs> well, it's, well right. when you know stuff, you're allowed. Um, <laughs> the, I, I guess my, you, you you raised the question about Lebanon specifically. Um, I mean, I guess my take on it is that um, my concern about something like um, the 1206 program where the Pentagon is running its own train and equip operation and it doesn't have the same genesis, the same kind of transparency safeguards that the traditional State Department programs have had, rather than try to see if you can, after the fact, create that transparency, I, I would prefer to see these things situated at state and have some of those basic decisions uh, about what the direction of policy should be in a given country, region, made at that level, you know, that kind of discussion as opposed to feeling like, well, we want to, we have to move quickly, we want to get the weapons there, we want to, you know, sort of have, uh, to let expediency sort of override what I would see as a more balanced approach to deciding whether you should be sending the weapons in the first place. Now, it, it could be that it's not that this particular bureaucratic issue is, is not the, the main problem there, but I, I see it as, as a, a serious concern. And in terms of the um, in terms of going forward, you know, the fact that some of the same methods that have evolved with respect to Iraq and Afghanistan might then be applied on a broader scale to me is a, is a step in the wrong direction. But I, I do think, you know, we, we should have somebody in common. We should have a discussion of it sometime that's, you know, to the degree that the level of detail that it probably warrants, which in an overview that we've done probably is not um, sufficient. Yeah, I think the Lebanon case is, exa is, is exactly that. It's a, it's a symptom of the failure of the larger national security architecture to be able to prevent the situation in the fir first place. And so you, there you have, you know, your national command authority making a decision about okay, well, we've got all these weapons coming in from uh, from states we don't like, and they're tipping the balance, and it's too late to do anything else. And and it oftentimes, um, not in all the cases, but in sometimes we've just let the situation metastasize so late, in part because the other elements of our national security community have withered, have atrophied, uh, and are ineffective. Um, Unfunded, whatever it is, and I think I think I think it's a it's a great kind of classic 
symptom of the larger problem. And I think that, you know, Secretary Gates is, is kind of cognizant of that. Um, you know, our, we just we can't be relying on, um, on kind of the saving throws from the Defense Department, especially as the, as the situation, as the, the challenges facing the United States become more and more complex. It requires, and I think my sense is that, you know, it's uh, Mr. Mr. Locker, I think his name is, looking at a National Security Act for the 21st century. How do we, how do we actually do that reform? How do we get that um, strategic overview back in place um, at, at an interagency level and make that interagency work? And, and I'm hoping that this administration can really kind of make some progress on that um, fast. So, sir, questions? Uh, Greg Sanders. CSIS Defense Initiative Group, Industrial Initiative Group. Uh, so in addition to FMS, uh, we have tens of billions of licensed direct commercial sales. Um, I didn't, I skimmed that, I didn't see too much discussion of that. What concerns are common when we're doing direct commercial sales as with FMS sales? And what areas um, is it less of a symbolic problem perhaps if it's direct commercial sales? Uh, well, my, my biggest issue with the commercial sales with respect to this um, report was that the, uh, I have serious problems with the data and the way they collect it. Um, I don't know what's happening, but um, basically there's, there's kind of two levels. There's a, you get a license through the State Department to sell something, and then you sell it or you don't. And they used to make some effort to figure out whether, in fact, you had sold it. Now they post up these huge numbers in the in the Pentagon's you know f uh, fun facts book about this stuff um, that make it seem like commercial sales have increased tenfold in a few years' time, which I'm almost certain is not the case. So, um, for, as an analytical point, we we just had to put that to the side. I, I couldn't get this answer that made sense to me. I, I didn't use any of that data, but it would have um, indicated those numbers that I was citing would have been higher had we had some reliable numbers on commercial sales. In, in terms of the, the political or policy impact, um, you know, I think whether it's done through the foreign military sales program where the Pentagon has a much more direct role, they're kind of the broker, they set the rules of the road, they help with the spare parts, or it's done as a commercial sale and the, corp the companies bear more of that burden, it, it's still a decision of the United States government, you know, to uh, allow transfer of given military capability to given countries. So I, you know, I'd, I'd say my biggest um, issue in that area would be to have better information. Because uh, I think it really, um, it, it makes it almost impossible to figure out exactly how much weaponry we're selling. It's clearly not those big numbers that are in these reports, but it's, it's more than what I have, uh, we've been able to cite in, in our report. Okay. Sir. Up oh, the microphone's coming. Hi, Jeff Abramson with Arms Control today. It's intriguing to me, depending on which room you go to for this conversation, the way it gets framed. Um, I think I've been in conversations where it's about how do we make sure U.S. companies are getting the best deal and thriving, um, which is intriguing. I think if you frame this conversation as a market, it, it you lose if you're taking it from the point of view that that you're trying to present it as. Um, but I'd like to sort of delve in that realm briefly. Um, and I think Richard Grimmett's report, which you use for some of the data, I think his finding is that since the end of the Cold War, a lot of the foreign military sales have now moved from sort of a strategic political side to more of a, this is driven by an economic market. And whether you, think, you see that happening and what that means, and especially what that might mean in terms of international, global control of the, of the trade, would someone else just fill in a market niche if the U.S. left it? I don't find a compelling argument, but one that I often hear. And then if it, just finally continuing this market idea, if we are in a global economic downturn, are you seeing that in this market in any way? Would we expect, uh, not that we're happy about a global economic downturn, but maybe that there'll be less of this in the near future? Um, well, to start at the but the last point, um, I think it's going to be interesting to see, because I, I mentioned there's a number of big deals that have been thrown on the table in the last few months. Uh, joint strike fighters uh, for Israel, uh, that anti-missile system for the UAE, a uh, whole range of items for Taiwan. Um, there's, there's stuff 
going back before that from uh, you know oil exporting states that clearly felt they had the, the resources to make some of these huge purchases. There's no guarantee that all those will will um, make it all the way through. You know that offer can be on the table and can just be allowed to kind of uh, the deal can be allowed to sort of go away based on availability of funds. So um, that being said, I, there may be some push on the part of the industry to even accelerate some of this stuff, the, the arms exporting companies, to, to try to get it as far down the road as possible so it's harder for uh, either side to uh, to back out, to sort of get these things on the books and not just have them as lingering out there as, as uh, possible uh, sales. Um, in, in terms of the sort of the, the market, uh, the, the Grimmick question, um, you know, is, is the is the market sort of driving a lot of these decisions more so than security concerns? Um, I think it's still a mixed question. I, I mean, there's no doubt now, I think, because I think military spending will at least level off, maybe even come down a little bit, uh, because there are not going to be as many countries with money in their pockets to buy huge big ticket weapons, even as we might have thought there might have been three or six months ago. Um, the industry is going to hammer on the economics. You're going to hear it from uh, certain pundits. You're going to hear it from certain members of Congress. Uh, but uh, I, I still think, even given that, that, that the, the strategic uh, arguments will carry the day, uh, because I think it's just too important to um, <coughs> the security of the world to, to let it be just driven by economic forces. So they're going to be there, they're going to have to be addressed, and there are arguments about, you know, what decisions should be made, what policy should be pursued. But I, I don't think they'll be um, decisive. That's my humble take on it. It'll be interesting to see what the Obama stimulus plan actually does to this, because a lot of our light manufacturing is actually in the defense sector. Um, and to the extent that the Obama administration is interested in, in infrastructure and reestablishing re um, green jobs and that whole line of conversation, will that bring back light infrastructure and provide kind of a, a, a pressure relief valve for the lost jobs potentially from the, on the, on the, uh, on the uh, defense sales side? But uh, it'll be interesting to see to what extent that, that affects the market pressures, at least in relationship to Congress. Um, one more question before we go. Um, we're going to go to the gentleman in the back. Hi, I'm, I'm Kevin Barron with the Boston Globe. And I would like to combine a couple of the thoughts I heard about whether or not we, the greater focus should be on the smaller items like the cluster bombs or the larger ones like the F-16s. Um, that combined with what you just said, Mr. Doty, on, uh, on um, being able to track commercial sales. Um, we're looking a little bit right now at Colt and the future of the M4, uh, which uh, soon enough, uh, as soon as next year, might be uh, opened up to uh, competition. and. Colt positioning itself for something down the road of, of, of selling the M4 abroad, um, and is the U.S. you know doing enough to prepare itself for that? For you know, watching small arms, um, you know the, that small arms movement says more people in conflict are dying from small arms, not from things like Stingers and F-16s, um, but they're different you know, concerns. Can you balance those out? Have any comments or thoughts on that? And just so you're clear, I'm actually Mr. Doherty. He's Mr. Oh, Hartung, just so the, the, oh, the story's got it straight. He's just <laughs> sitting behind my sign, so. Apologies. But Bill, go ahead. I arrived late, too, so apologies. For <laughs> which uh, level of uh, arms are we talking about? I, I was going to try to pass myself off as Laura Lumpy, but that, that, was, not, <laughs> <laughs> that was not a practical uh, uh, thought on my part. Um, uh, I think it's, a, it's really hard to. Um, sort of like picking your poison. I mean, I think there's no question that the small arms and light weapons have more immediate impacts. They're the ones that are used in the conflicts as we speak. They're more portable. They're harder to get, keep control of once they're out in the marketplace. Uh, they get recycled. They make themselves into the illegal market. Uh, so I, I, I think if I was looking at a kind of a, a humanitarian human rights approach to it, that, that would be a primary concern. And, and I think um, also in terms of moving policy, I, I think our chances of, uh, and this is me talking, not somebody who's immersed in the issue uh, like Marcus, but um, I think that I see more promise in the United States maybe coming around in something like the Cluster Munitions Convention and, the, and a ban on cluster bomb exports than building some big architecture for uh, discussions on um, 
eliminating uh, major conventional arms sales by region, even though that's something I would like to see um, happening. So uh, there's also other experts in the room if you want to talk uh, as we leave, like people like Rachel Stoll, Natalie Goldring, who are very uh, immersed in the issue of small arms and light weapons and have helped make a difference on that area. So feel free to also uh, buttonhole them as well as talk to, to the panel. As a totally non-scientific comment on, on that answer, um, having worked in the Balkans um, while we were being shelled and um, under threat from various corners, um, the thing I was most worried about was not the artillery, not the small arms, but the cluster mun munitions. Um, uh, if you don't drop it, don't pick it up was the first thing I learned, and it stuck in my brain the entire time. Um, the, the families that we worked with um, doing development, if you're interested in economic development and essentially what Southern Command is talking about, it's, it's going to be dealing with those, um, those more pervasive, um, brainless uh, weapons that are out there uh, in the environment. So just my own two cents on that. But uh, does anybody else want to make a quick comment? Yeah, or it can be on anything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the most recent question. Um, all right, with that, we're going to close up. I know there are a lot of other questions. Please feel free to come on up. Um, and uh, Bill's happy to give out some autographs. Thanks so much. Oh, yes. <laughs>